Now let's run with our these definitions of the scaled and twisted Fibonacci and the scaled and twisted Lucas sequences. Those satisfy a Pythagorean relationship. They have the right starting values to be cosine and sine, and we'll uh, we'll get them to be exactly cosine and sine, sine and cosine, respectively, of something uh, in a little bit. But let's look at the table of identities that we started with, or this table of, of analogies. Let's see if it makes at least the identities look more like what they, what they were over here. There were definitely issues that made them not identical, and we're going to see that it really fixes those, those issues. Okay, so for example, the one we started with, the sum formula. So let's look at u sub m plus n instead of the Fibonacci. Okay, by our definition, we scale it, we twist it. Oops, I'm not going to, it's going to start editing on me. We scale it, we twist it. Um, so here's f m m plus n scaled and twisted. Now, we know that this has an identity that looks like the sine sum identity and with an extra one half. Now, again, if you're uh, wondering, well, are we ever going to prove this? I am going to come back and prove this, um, or at least I'm going to indicate how we can kind of reverse all the steps here and make this into a proof. Um, but right now, we're still assuming that somebody's proved this identity on Fibonacci and Lukács, and then we're just going to see how that reflects in terms of u and v. Okay, so now I'm just going to split everything up. The root, root 5 over 2 wants to go with the fm, and then there's an extra 1 half, conveniently enough, which goes with the ln. And remember, the definition of Vn, you know what, I'm going to write these over here on my scratch because they're so useful. Root 5 over 2, i to the n minus 1, Fn, that's a un, and Vn is i to the n over 2 times ln. Okay. So we're just going to collect everything. Well, okay, so we actually see this is going to be um right here. And I'm splitting up the powers of i. That's really crucial. You, the m minus 1 goes with the fm, and then the rest of it is an i to the n, and voila, that's vn. Similarly, this guy is um, and this guy, eh, I don't want to edit it. I just want to highlight it. This guy is vn. So we, exa we exactly get something that looks precisely like the sum formula for the sine function. This is a very good, good sign. Similarly, um minus n, you you could really derive this from this from this guy in the symmetry, but we can look at it real quickly. It's the same kind of deal. Write it out. Look at the formula. And this one was annoying, even more annoying, somewhat more distant from sine and cosine, it seemed, because of the minus 1 at the end. And we'll see how the i automatically fixes that. Okay. So, um, again, what we're going to do here is we're going to take a minus 1 at the end. That's really an i to the 2n. Okay. So here, we want to be pretty fluent with our complex numbers. Um, and that's going to change a mi m minus n minus 1 to m plus n minus 1, which is exactly what we need to split it up into an i to the m minus 1 with here and an i to the n with the ln. And it all works out beautifully. Okay. Um, similarly, u2n, this is really just a, a corollary of the sum formula, but it's nice how it works out. You write it out in terms of f2n, and the f2n is just fn ln. Okay, so as usual, the root 5 over 2 and n minus 1 of these i's goes with fn. i to the n over 2 goes with ln, but wait a minute. There wasn't an extra 1 half here. That's okay, because putting in the 1 half needs to be canceled by a 2, and you get u2n is 2unvn. That's exactly analogous to sine of 2x is 2 sine x cosine x. Similarly, for the Lucas sum, we're going to write out vm plus 1, m plus n is a scaled and twisted version of Lucas. We're going to write out this funky thing that seemed pretty weird. Uh, let's, let me remind you what it looked like in the original. It's got a 1 half in the front, and it looks... It's LMLN plus 5 FMFN. So we had a plus 5 instead of a minus and an overall 1 half. And we're going to see how we fixed all of that. Okay. We've got um, the 1 half comes out to make this an over 4. The 5 is coming in here. Okay. So we're going to split up the IM and the I to the N in front of the Lukács factors. And the 4 turns into 2 and 2. That turns into VMVN. Beautiful. Okay. Now the 5, of course, splits up into a root 5 squared, or root 5 times root 5. So I'm going to take m of the i's and put them in front of the fm, and n of the i's in front of the fn, but wait a minute. 
that's the wrong number to turn into um. It's i to the n minus 1. And this is i to the n minus 1. Oh, I've got two extra i's. That's an i squared that cancels this plus, or that turns the plus into a minus. And voila, we've got something that's exactly analogous to um, the sum formula for cosine. Cosine, cosine, minus sine, sine. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to do the rest of them because they, uh, all the rest of them, because they really follow easily. So, but let's look at the symmetry. Okay. U sub minus n, scaled and twisted version of f minus n. So this is, we're going to take i to the minus n minus 1 basic, based on the definition of u. Just putting in a minus n here and here. And then what happens when I look at that? i to the minus n minus 1, that's i to the n minus 1 times i to the minus 2n. Ah, i to the minus 2n is minus 1 to the n. It's exactly just the reciprocal of this guy. Oops, I didn't want to click on that. Okay. And then I'm going to rewrite this in a little bit of a weird way. Okay. Um, F sub n. Well, no, just how I, how I wrote it before. So remember, the symmetry of F sub minus n that we saw very clearly from the table is that it's minus 1 to the n times Fn, but with an extra minus to make the minus signs work out. All right, so the minus 1 to the n's cancel. The extra minus comes out, which we actually want it to do. The root 5 over 2 is totally unchanged. The i to the n minus 1 is now correct to be collected back into the un. So this is an odd function. It's an odd sequence. Not meaning it has odd numbers as values. It means that it has odd symmetry like an odd function. u sub minus n is minus un. OK, so now v sub minus n, uh, we're just going to plug it into the definition here and minus n in both places. And then again, um, this one has a little bit simpler symmetry. This is uh, has the minus 1 to the n times ln. So let's collect this. We've got a minus 1 to the n and an i to the minus n. Well, that's a 1 over i to the n. So this all is minus 1 over i to the n, and very, very essential thing all the time when you're calculating. Oh, you can't see that. Let's put it over here. Okay. Very, very essential. And another one is minus i is 1 over i. Often, we're going to have a 1 over i, and we're going to preferentially write it as minus i, because it just looks conceptually easier. It's not division, it's just subtraction, it's just uh, negation. Okay, so that collapses to i to the n over 2 ln, that's exactly the n. So this guy is an even sequence, has even symmetry. Very pretty. Okay, so it's very, very suggestive that u n and, and should be the sine of something and v n should be the cosine of something. But hopefully in between the two videos you uh, looked at this and realized how utterly ridiculous that seems at first. Okay, Sines and cosines normally when you put in real values for their arguments don't give anything outside minus 1 to 1. They certainly don't grow without bound like f n and l n do. Okay, and that's where we have to think harder about sine and cosine, and the fact that as soon as we put in complex numbers into here, we've got a much more general idea of what sine and cosine can do. So part of this is really to lure you into the world, uh, if you haven't already been there, of what, how interesting sine and cosine are as functions of a complex variable. So let's see where we are. We're down here. Okay, so the fundamental thing that starts all of this, of course, is Euler's formula. e to the i t is cosine t plus i sine t. Um, if you want a justification of that, you could go watch my videos on the killer app for complex numbers. And there's many other places to see it. Um, there's various ways to, you can either think of this as a definition, or you can prove it by basically having definitions of these things in terms of power series or solutions of differential equations or various other things. But let's just treat this as a known fact. And uh, similarly, e to the s plus i t, the rules of for exponentials still work. Um, this is going to be e to the s times cosine t plus i sine t. So that gives a definition to e to any complex number. Um, and what we're going to see is often we're going to think about things like e to the i z for z a complex number, or e to the minus i z for z a complex number. Well, that still works because plus or minus i z, those are both just complex numbers, and we can put them into here when necessary. Okay, so this is really the most important thing in, I don't know, all of mathematics, I don't know, it's in all of sort of analytical mathematics, calculus type mathematics, the definition of the exponential function on its natural domain, the complex numbers, incredibly important.
A uh, corollary of this guy, very simple corollary, you're the minus i t, uh, back to where t is just a real number, cosine t minus i sine t, just using the symmetries of, of cosine and sine. And what does that give us? Well, add these two equations together. Um, pause and try it, uh, if you haven't ever done this before. Add those two equations and together and divide by 2, you'll get cosine t is e to the i t plus e to the minus i t over 2. And that's a definition of cosine in terms of a complex exponential, which is pretty cool. If you subtract them, if you take this equation minus this equation, you'll have to divide by 2i, but you'll get a, a, a way to isolate sine t. That tells you sine t is e to the i t minus e to the minus i t over 2i. Now, so far, we've only been looking at t being a real variable, but this gives us a very good way, a very natural way, to define cosine and sine of a complex variable. And this is the absolute standard definition of what cosine and sine of a complex variable is. You just let this variable be complex and use exactly this formula. And you realize that you have a definition for e to the ic. Now, this might seem kind of circular, but it's not. Um, if you know cosine and sine for real numbers, that's what you're using here. This definition, use e to the iz, if you expand out z in terms of real imaginary parts, you will actually get this in terms of exponentials and sines and cosines of real numbers. Okay, But in a lot of ways, um, you just start understanding this one well enough on its own terms, and that gives you enough to understand cosine and sine. Okay, um, And we'll see some explicit examples of how this works out with our, with our case. It'll, it'll be a good, a good excuse to, to really get our hands through with that. One thing that's really helpful, if you are somewhat familiar with a hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine. Um, that really helps, because the first thing you'd like to do with these definitions is not go to a co totally general complex number, but go to just i t, uh, where t is still a real number. So what's cosine of a pure imaginary number? OK, by this definition, you get e to the i squared t, oh, that's e to the minus t, e to the minus i squared t, that's actually back, back to plus 1. So e to the minus I, t plus e to the t over 2, that's exactly just cosh of t. Um, and that's a real number. So the cosine of a pure imaginary number is not um, complex. It's not, it's, it's, it's not a non-real number. It's just a real number. It's cosh. Okay? Now, that's not quite true for sine of i t. If you plug it in, you get e to the minus t minus e to the t, same deal, with a minus here, over 2i. And so that's minus 1 over i cinch. Oh, yeah, minus 1 over i is just i. That's right here. So it's i cinch t. So it is complex. It is pure imaginary, but it's not in a very complicated way. It's just um, the cinch t function, but sort of shooting up and down the axis. Okay. So there's a deep, deep relation between cosine and cosh, sine and cinch, which totally makes sense. If you've ever looked at a table of identities of the ordinary trig functions compared to a table of identities for cosh and cinch, you'll see that half of them are the same, and half of them are the same except with a minus sign pl plugged in. That's exactly because sometimes the i gets squared and you get a minus sign. It's very much like what we're doing with the twisting. It's a simple example of that. Now, we'll, we'll come back to that relationship um, in a later video. OK, so I want to finish this one up pretty quickly. Um, oh, yeah, so if you want to take if you, if you want to get away from this definition, even though this is really the, the most elegant definition of cosine and sine for a complex variable, let's look at it as cosine of real plus imaginary. And the thing is, it's not that hard to show, based on this definition or whatever definition you like, like, like power series, for example. Uh, if you use the ordinary power series for cosine and sine and just plug in a complex number, it's totally equivalent to this. Um, the cosine and sine sum formulas still work verbatim. And then we can just use these guys to figure out what like cosine of s plus i t is. So you get cos cos minus sine sine, turn the cos i t and sine i t into cosh and cinch, and you get something that's actually relatively uh, easy to understand if you're happy with all four of these functions. It's cos cosh minus i sin cinch, so sine cinch. Okay, And then here, sine of s plus i t sine cosh plus i cosine cinch. So the real part of it is something that mixes ordinary and hyperbolic trig. The imaginary part mixes ordinary and hyperbolic trig, but in a different way. And you just have to keep track of the i's and the, and the signs, the, like the plus and minus signs. Okay. So this is really good. This is about as down to earth as you can get for cosine and sine of a complex variable. Okay. In particular, 
The thing about cinch and cosh is that for large values of t, either positive or negative, they tend to look like, say, e to the t over 2 or e to the minus t over 2. And they're exponentially growing functions. Okay, That's the graphs of cosh and cinch, I'll remind you real quick. Graph of cosh looks like this, and it's growing exponentially both ways. Graph of cinch looks like this. There's cosh t. There's cinch t. Um, and they grow exponentially, cosh both plus and cinch plus and minus as you go off. And that's what allows the cosine or sine of a complex variable to grow without bound and produce a whole range of values in the complex numbers um, because they're really secretly accessing the exponential growth that's in cosh and cinch. Okay, so the summary, the summary of that is that cosine and sine are exponentially growing functions. So tell that to somebody who doesn't know this stuff. That's a that's a good little uh, bomb drop to drop at a cocktail party, um, but in the imaginary direction, and people will will titter and be impressed, right? Um, so what we would like to do is, we, here's our conjecture that we'll work on in the next video. We think that u sub n is the sign of n times some magic complex number L, and v sub n is the cosine of n times some magic complex number L. And remember, those are very directly related to the um, Fibonacci and Luca in this way. So with just a mild alteration, scaling and twisting, you get things, and then we have to figure out what the magic number L is, you get cosine and sine. Okay.